Hello, and welcome to this session on long-acting antiretroviral HIV treatment regimens, key consideration for stakeholders. My name is Glenn Clark, and I am the AIDS Drug Assistance Program Advisor in the Division of State HIV AIDS Programs at the HIV AIDS Bureau. I'm joined today by Lieutenant Commander Emeka Egwim, who is a pharmacist and a senior policy analyst in HAB's Division of Policy and Data, and also Tim Horn, who is the Director of Medication Access and Pricing at NASDED. Next slide. The focus of this presentation is on long-acting antiretroviral HIV regimens and their potential impact if approved on HIV care delivery models, providers, patients, and payers. We will briefly discuss the drugs, highlight key findings from the ATLAS and FLAIR studies, and discuss these potential impacts in more depth. Next slide. Here is the required disclosure statement. I'll give you just a moment to read it. As you can see, we have three learning objectives for this session. The first is to describe the pharmacology of the long-acting antiretrovirals, or ARVs. The second is to gain an understanding of the key findings from the long-acting antiretroviral clinical trials. And the third is to discuss implementation approaches for providers, patients, and payers. In the next few slides, I'd like to briefly remind you of the context in which the Ryan White HIV AIDS program operates. The HIV AIDS Bureau is one of the bureaus and offices within the Health Resources and Services Administration, or HRSA. While you may not hear a lot about HRSA, it provides many of the key federal healthcare safety net programs for geographically isolated and economically or medically vulnerable people in the United States and its territories. Next slide. The vision of the HIV AIDS Bureau is optimal HIV care and treatment for all. Its mission is to provide leadership and resources to assure access to and retention in high quality integrated care and treatment services for vulnerable people with HIV and their families. Next slide. I'm sure you are all aware of the key role the Ryan White HIV AIDS program plays in the health of people living with HIV in the United States and its territories. As the ADEP advisor, I'd be remiss if I didn't highlight the foundational role that providing access to medication plays in achieving health outcomes for people with HIV. And today we'll hear more about an upcoming treatment option, long-acting antiretrovirals, and what their impact might be on our system and health outcomes. Now I'm pleased to turn it over to Tim Horn from NASTED to provide background on long-acting antiretrovirals. Tim? Great, thanks, Glenn. Um, it's a pleasure to be here uh, with you and Emeka, um, albeit uh, virtually. Um, uh, and I very much uh, appreciate the opportunity to join you both in introducing these exciting new HIV treatment modalities, and importantly, to discuss some of the preparedness uh, that will be required to maximize Ryan White and ADAP you know, client access uh, to these exciting um, um, products. Uh, next slide, please. So what is a long-acting medication exactly? Um, it is a drug or biologic formulation that has been engineered to maintain therapeutic, efficacious, and tolerable levels uh, being slowly absorbed by the body relative to the dose administered. It also persists in the tissues, notably where the medication um, is injected or implanted before being metabolized or excreted from the body. Now, the result is an extended period of time that a quantity of a drug or biologic remains in the body relative to its dose compared to immediate release or even delayed release medications. Now, it's worth noting that some delayed release antiretrovirals are actually available, uh, but these are designed primarily to allow for once daily um, oral dosing of medications that might otherwise require twice daily dosing. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's a visual representation of long-acting drugs compared to immediate release drugs. So beginning with the vertical y-axis on the left, um, we have the concentration of a drug in the body. Now, this corresponds with the two dashed lines in the figure, the top of the therapeutic window and the bottom of the therapeutic window. So drug concentrations that exceed the therapeutic window uh, may be associated with an increased risk of serious toxicities or side effects. 
And drug concentrations that fall below the therapeutic window may mean not enough drug in the body to maintain HIV suppression and, as a result, an increased risk of drug resistance and treatment failure. Now, on the horizontal x-axis, we have time. And the red curve depicts an immediate release drug, which includes all the oral antiretrovirals now available for the treatment of HIV. And the green curve represents a long-acting product. So the space between um, um, uh, each curve or within each curve is known as the, well, the area under the curve or AUC. And the goal is to maximize the length of time the AUC remains within the therapeutic window. And whereas the therapeutic exposure associated with an immediate release um, antiretroviral may be somewhere in the ballpark of you know, 12, 24, um, you know, even 36 hours, therapeutic exposure levels for long-acting medications may be measured in days, weeks, or even months. Next slide, please. So there are a number of potential advantages associated with long-acting antiretrovirals. First, you know, they can address suboptimal adherence. And while long-acting carbotegravir and ropivirine, uh, which are the products we'll be uh, focusing on today, um, does require first achieving virologic suppression with daily oral therapy and potentially overcoming any immediate suboptimal adherence challenges, there may, there may be important opportunities for supporting long-term adherence with these products. And I will also add is that a number of the um, long-acting um, products that are in the pipeline uh, may be able to be implemented uh, re really with the, with the beginning of therapy and therefore can potentially address some of the immediate um, suboptimal um, adherence challenges that many people living with HIV you do in fact face. So second, long-acting injectable products in particular may help overcoming physiologic or behavioral challenges associated with oral medications. And these include gastrointestinal, you know, neurologic, or psychiatric diseases. Now, there is also the appeal of simplification and less frequent dosing um, may in fact help to prevent or alleviate pill fatigue, which is something that many people live, living with HIV who have been taking pills for, for years, even decades, you do in fact experience. Now, there's also concerns of privacy and stigma associated with taking oral medications for HIV. And long-acting injectables you know, allow for confidential administration and potentially avoid antiretroviral pills from being discovered by family members, by employers, and so on. Next slide, please. So the pipeline of long-acting antiretrovirals really is quite robust. Now, highlighted here are a number of long-acting products by antiretroviral class, several of which are already well-known to providers and people living with HIV. These include nucleoside and non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, integrase inhibitors, and entry inhibitors. And at least one new class of drugs, um, known as capsid inhibitors, you know, includes at least one candidate with a long-acting injectable potential. Now, of note, there are a variety of administration routes being evaluated for these products. There are injectable products, including those that are administered intramuscularly and those uh, for potential subcutaneous administration, um, which is the, the injection of a product directly under the skin uh, versus intramuscular, which really does require um, injecting a product directly into, into muscle, sometimes into deep muscle. Now, also in development are devices that can be implanted under the skin you know, via a minor surgical procedure and are capable of slowly releasing drugs over a period of time, um, or in, in many cases, several months. Um, also, there are intravaginal ring technology, including the Duravarine ring currently under evaluation uh, for pre-exposure prophylaxis for cisgender women and transgender men. And the pipeline also includes multi-purpose uh, technology products, such as intravaginal rings capable of releasing a drug to prevent not only HIV infection, but also other STIs, um, as well as pregnancy. Next slide, please. So long-acting versions of cabotegravir and ropivirine are the products furthest along in the development and currently under FDA review for treatment. Now, one half of the long-acting uh, treatment regimen is carbotegravir, which is an integrase inhibitor. 
And long acting carbotegravir is also being evaluated as an injectable for pre exposure prophylaxis with some really important and exciting data regarding its safety and efficacy for PrEP reported during the virtual International AIDS Conference last month. And so, for treatment, you know, carbotegravir is paired with ropivirine, a non nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor that was the first approved for oral use as treatment for HIV in 2011. And both products have been formulated as long-acting ejectable nanosuspensions for intramuscular administration. Now, carbotegravir will also be available for oral dosing for use in combination with oral ropivirine as part of the lead-in dosing required, which we'll be discussing a little bit later. And FDA approval of long-acting carbotegravir and ropivirine to be co-packaged and sold as Cabinuva uh, was expected in December of 2019, but is now expected to be approved and commercialized early in 2021. I will also note that Cabinuva was first approved globally in Canada in March of this year. Next slide, please. So with respect to uh, long-acting carbotegravir and ropivirine's efficacy and safety, data from three phase three clinical trials um, have yielded some very encouraging results. So first we have the FLARE study, um, which was Vive Healthcare's treatment naive study. And in this study, participants started HIV treatment with an induction regimen of oral trimec taken for 20 weeks to achieve virologic suppression. Um, they were then randomized to either stay on the oral regimen or switch to a maintenance regimen of injectable carbotegravir and ropivirine administered every four weeks. Now, to ensure the tolerability of both drugs before they were actually injected, which is irreversible, and because there is no anecdote available uh, for um, in, in case of any adverse events uh, related to carbotegravir or ropivirine, participants in this switch group first took oral carbotegravir and ropivirine for a month before switching to the injections. Next slide, please. Okay, so there was also the ATLAS study, which, was, um, which randomized patients who were already virologically suppressed using a standard oral regimen to either remain on their oral regimen or switch to long-acting injections of carbotegravir and ropivirine um, as maintenance therapy administered again every four weeks. And as with FLAIR, participants randomized to switch to the long-acting injectables took oral carbotegravir and ropivirine for a month to help ensure safety. Next slide, please. Now, there's also the ATLAS 2M study, which allotted more than 1,000 volunteers with suppressed viral loads, including you know, many of the ATLAS study participants to receive long-acting carbotegravir and ropivirine injections either every four weeks or every eight weeks. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So a quick snapshot of the top line results from FLAIR and ATLAS evaluating long-acting carbotegravir and ropivirine administered every four weeks. So the FLAIR trial, oh, can you back up one? <clears throat> Thanks, Emeka. So, uh, so the FLAIR trial shown on the left um, included, <clears throat> or excuse me, included 556 people starting uh, their first HIV treatment. Now, just over 20% um, um, of study volunteers were women, um, nearly three quarters were white, 18% were black, and the median age was approximately 34 years. At baseline, a fifth um, of the study volunteers had a viral load of 100,000 copies or higher, and the median CD4 count was 444 cells uh, per cubic millimeter. <clears throat> now, as, as illustrated here, rates of virologic suppression defined as HIV RNA at or above 50 copies per mil at week 48 in the study um, were very low in both groups, 2.1% in the injectable group and 2.5% in, in the oral therapy group. And biologic success rates were 93.6% um, and 93.3% respectively, demonstrating non-inferiority between the two groups. Now, the ATLAS trial on the right <clears throat> included 616 um, treatment experience uh, patients. A third were women, two thirds were white, about a quarter were black, and the median age was 42 years. They had been on antiviral therapy for a median of four years, 
and all had viral suppression upon entering the ATLAS study with a median CD4 count um, of 653 cells, um, again at baseline. Now, as with FLARE, rates of virologic non-response, again defined as HIV RNA at or above 50 copies at week 48, were very low in both groups. 1.6% um, with injectable carbotegravir and lopivirine versus 1% uh, uh, with continued oral regimens. Biologic success rates were 92.5% and 95.5% respectively. <clears throat> um, so, uh, yeah, next slide, please. Okay, so week 48 data um, from Atlas 2M um, comparing long acting carbotegravir and repilverine administered every four weeks or eight weeks uh, were presented at the virtual conference on retroviruses and opportunistic infections in March. And rates of virologic non response were 1.7% um, um, in the you know, every eight week dosing group compared to 1% in the every four week dosing group. And virologic success rates were, were high in both groups, 94.3% and 93.5% respectively. And based on these findings, maintenance therapy dosing every eight weeks was deemed to be non-inferior to every four week dosing regimens. Next slide, please. Okay, so with respect to safety, um, treatment in all three studies uh, was generally safe and well tolerated and serious adverse events were rare among people using carbotegravir and lopivirine. Now, important to note are the injection site reactions in Flare and Atlas, and certainly injection site reactions you know, would be considered you know, one of the more novel uh, sort of adverse events that would be associated with, a, uh, with any sort of injectable therapy. So injection site reactions, predominantly pain, occurred in 20% to 30% of participants. And these were most common early in the studies, um, were generally mild or moderate and improved over time, lasting an average of three days. And four people in Atlas um, versus three in Flare actually dropped out due to injection site reactions. Next slide, please. Okay, so patient satisfaction among study volunteers receiving injections every four or eight weeks in Flare, Atlas, and Atlas 2M was really quite high. And I wanted to note a comment by the University of Nebraska's uh, Susan Swindoll's uh, during her 2019 data um, uh, or, or, or 2019 review um, of the data of the, of the Atlas study. And she noted that you know, they, being study volunteers, um, like not having to worry about taking their pills every day. They get their injection and they're good to go. They don't have to think about having um, HIV every day. They don't have to worry about coworkers or housemates seeing their pill bottles. There's maybe some relief of the stigma of HIV if they don't have to think about it um, every day. And that, that sort of quote from Dr. Swindoll's, that sort of summary you know, of the, that the patient experiences in these studies really does speak to the potential you know, for these agents um, for, um, for our Y and Y clients. Uh, next slide, please. So with approval of long-acting carbotegravir or mopivirine, there are some important dosing considerations that both providers and patients will need to be aware of. First, a standard um, antiretroviral regimen to achieve and maintain virological suppression will be required before long-acting carbotegravir and ropivirine can be safely and effectively started. Also required will be an oral um, you know, lead-in period involving a 30 milligram tablet combined with a 25 milligram ropivirine tablet you know, to be used once daily for four weeks to ensure the tolerability of both drugs um, before uh, they are administered by injection. Now, you know, these, um, uh, these two tablets um, will likely be a limited distribution um, established by the healthcare, you know, possibly a direct supply of these tablets to providers. Now, you know, once oral lead-in dosing is completed, um, injections you know, can commence. Of note, the initial FDA approval will be for intramuscular injections of carbotegravir and ropivirine every four weeks. Now, intramuscular injections every eight weeks, based on the Atlas 2M results, will require a separate FDA data review and approval timeline. Now, the loading doses of carbotegravir and ropivirine consist of two 
three milliliter injections administered once. Now, four weeks later, two two milliliter injections are administered and repeated every four weeks. Now, of note, there's a grace period for injections, uh, which was plus or minus one week from the schedule of injection uh, from the schedule of injections in the flare and atlas studies, and that the, we do anticipate that the FDA package insert will provide similar guidance. Now, importantly, these are provider administered products as they require gluteus medius injections and will require a Z tracking injection technique to ensure that both drugs are deposited correctly in the muscles before slow release. Now, also of importance, patients will need to have access to an oral regimen in the event of significant delays receiving regular maintenance therapy injections for the reasons that Emeka will be reviewing in more detail. Next slide. So as provider administered drug products, the supply chain will be a bit different compared to oral prescription drugs. And co-packaged um, cabotegavir and ropivirine will primarily be available from several specialty pharmacies and specialty distributors who, who with experience handling, dispensing, and shipping provider administered drugs and biologics. Now, this is particularly true uh, for products like long-acting carbotegavir and ropivirine, which require end-to-end -end cold chain transport and storage. Now, while many providers have relationships with special distributors, you know, eight apps you know, typically work with wholesalers. And the good news is that product ordering from the big three of full-line wholesalers will be possible for eight apps. Next slide, please. Okay, so before turning things over to Emeka, I, I just wanted to note a few important provider administra uh, administration considerations. So first, you know, Beef Healthcare um, has, uh, has been primarily focused on clinic and provider office administration of long-acting cabotegavir uh, and lipivirine. Second, you know, this will be something of a paradigm shift for many Ryan White providers, which typically see clients particularly those um, who are well-maintained on an existing regimen every three to six months, whereas long-acting carbotegavir and, uh, uh, and rapivirine will now require monthly office visits, at least initially, uh, before potentially moving to office visits you know, every other month. Now, this ultimately raises capacity and staffing issues to support monthly injections, including increased scheduling, exam room availability, you know, um, uh, wait times, provider availability, you know, drug product storage, and inventory management. Um, additionally, you know, supporting monthly retention to make sure that clients return for the monthly injections may also be essential and may require additional resources and staffing. Now, there are also questions of Ryan White provider network sufficiency, particularly for clients residing in, say, rural areas who would like to use the long-acting products but are simply unable to travel long distances, particularly every four weeks for their injections. Now, this in turn has raised a number of questions regarding the potential for pharmacy administration of long-acting carbotegavir and uh, rapivirine to really help meet clients where they're at, um, while potentially um, minimizing you know, clinic capacity and resource issues. Now, pharmacy administration, particularly where product, um, products requiring intramuscular injections are involved, really is dependent on variable state laws and regulations. And pharmacies will also need to contend with capacity and space issues, particularly for a product requiring clients to at least you know, partially undress. And also, you know, pharmacists, uh, pharmacists' experience and cultural competence are you know, no less of important considerations uh, for, for, for certainly for our Ryan White providers, um, as well as people living with HIV. So I am going to stop there and turn this over to Emeka to uh, really sort of help to drill down onto some of the um, sort of like the, you know, uh, just beyond some of the supply chain issues, but certainly some of the payer considerations uh, that will need to be uh, taken into account. Uh, Emeka, over to you. Sure, thank you. And it is such a pleasure uh, to be able to speak on this particular topic, uh, being a practicing pharmacist and someone who has uh, a number of years of experience dealing with Medicaid uh, payer uh, and reimbursement policies. Um, the goal here really is to lend some perspective as to how payers 
uh, may consider this new uh, sort of advancement um, in their policy setting and how uh, providers as well as clients might need to position themselves as a result of what payers might do. And so now we want to talk about the impact of long-acting HIV antiretrovirals on third-party payers. Uh, again, we're going to be doing this through the lens of the cabotegravirol pivarine combination product, um, which um, was actually recently approved in Canada sometime uh, earlier this year. The considerations for payers are in part influenced by uh, the way the drug acts in the body, as well as the drug's indication or its approved uses. Of course, it's still this particular product is still being reviewed uh, by the FDA, um, as uh, Tim mentioned. The findings from the studies showed that uh, after a single dose of the injectable cabotegravir component of the product, uh, the drug persists in the body for an extended period of time, uh, in fact, up to three years in women and a year and a half in men. Um, and so this really would be that uh, long tail, the characterized long tail in the graph that was depicted earlier. All right, so now we're going to talk about the impact on payers um, as it relates to drug interactions, um, particularly given the attenuation of the drug in the body. Um, uh, there is certainly the potential for resistance to not only individuals, but communities as well. And in terms of drug, drug interactions um, or drug disease interactions, patients typically present with other conditions, many chronic conditions for which they need medication. And so, um, you know, there is some consideration as to the impact of a drug lingering in the body over an extended period of time on other medications um, or on other uh, conditions that a patient might have. Uh, there's also um, considerations around the risks and costs of resistance when there is non-adherence. Um, first, uh, resistance of cabotegravir for the individual, um, as well as the risk of transmitting resistant strains. Um, there's also uh, the potential impact on integrase inhibitors as a drug class. Um, as well as uh, potential resistance to the combination therapy. Um, and then lastly, potential impact on reproductive health. So the product that was approved in Canada, um, this cabotegravir-ropivirine combination product, uh, shows insufficient data in pregnant women, um, and it should not be used unless the potential benefits outweigh the potential risks. And this was what was approved on its sort of package insert, the label. So again, this is not to say that this particular drug class is not um, uh, to be recommended or to paint this particular type of drug in a negative light. Rather, it is to call some attention or perhaps shine some light as to how payers might consider um, some of these uh, pieces of information in their policy setting and coverage setting um, approaches. And so now we want to talk about drug pricing and cost considerations. Uh, adherence is a key factor impacting drug costs to payers. Um, and you know, when we talk about prices, the first thing that some payers might think about is the relative price of long-acting formulations versus the already present um, oral regimens. Express Scripts analyzed HIV patients who were taking single tablet regimens or multi-tablet regimens as intended. Uh, the data revealed important findings for healthcare professionals and third-party payers providing care and coverage for HIV patients. Specifically, uh, there were misperceptions about the costs um, uh, that may have been preventing prescribing or coverage of single-tablet regimens. There was this notion that single-tablet regimens were more expensive. However, 
the analysis found that about 75% of patients who were taking once a day pill uh, regimens took the medication as prescribed when compared to about 65% of those who were using multi-tablet regimens. So the convenience of a once a day pill and increased adherence uh, really should lower hospitalization and overall cost of care later. Um, the question is, can payers expect the same kind of results when comparing long-acting antiretrovirals to oral regimens? So now we want to talk about some of the drug administration logistics. Um, you know, the strategies and sort of the, the infrastructure that has to be in place to really get the medication to a provider or get the medication to ultimately to a client, to the patient. Um, there's the whole approach of monthly administration by a professional, which is uh, required for this drug, um, this formulation versus self-administered oral regimens. Um, this table is a comparison chart of itemized costs related to the logistics of accessing these uh, various types of drugs. White bagging uh, is a term that's used to describe when a pharmacy buys a drug from a wholesaler and delivers it to a patient's provider to have it administered to the patient. Brown bagging uh, describes when the pharmacy buys the drug from the wholesaler, then dispenses it to the patient who in turn takes the drug to the provider to have it administered in cases where it is a provider administered drug. The buy and bill model describes when a healthcare provider buys a drug from a wholesaler or a manufacturer and bills a patient's third party payer for the drug when it is administered. As we can see, uh, from this table, uh, the itemized cost for each logistic model differs with white bagging including the most line items and perhaps being the most costly of the group. Uh, given that the product that was recently approved, again, we're looking at things for now through the lens of that product. Um, given that that product requires administration by a healthcare professional, uh, we anticipate that payers and healthcare systems would default to either white bagging or buy and bill models, and payers will have to consider the costs associated with these two models. So now we want to talk about, um, you know, the logistics of administering the drug, um, and more importantly, how the drug is covered by particular payers, including Medicaid and Medicare. A drug like uh, a long-acting antiretroviral injectable, um, which requires special handling and administration, can be covered under the pharmacy benefit or the medical benefit or both, depending on the benefit design of the payer. The medical benefit is primarily characterized by the buy and bill model, where the provider buys the drug directly from the manufacturer or wholesaler to stock their practice, and when the drug is administered, the provider bills a third party payer for the drug, as well as the professional administration fees. The pharmacy benefit, on the other hand, is primarily characterized by white bagging or brown bagging, both of which involve the pharmacy buying the drug from the wholesaler or manufacturer. But it may also involve a buy and bill approach depending on the payer's reimbursement structure. We anticipate that CMS decision for Medicare would be to cover uh, this kind of drug under the medical benefit. However, Medicaid programs are state run and this decision will differ on a state by state basis. In terms of clinical consideration, there are quite a number that impact payers or perhaps influence payers. Remember, we're looking through the lens of the long-acting product that's been approved in Canada, but still under review in the US. And for this product, a patient has to have tried and been successful on the lead and oral formulations of the drug in terms of tolerability and viral suppression. So given this and uh, the fact that the long-acting injections must be administered by a healthcare professional, 
third party payers will be empowered to implement certain utilization management techniques that historically have not been most appropriate for HIV care and treatment standards. Using their drug utilization review boards and pharmacy and therapeutics committees, it can be expected that payers will need to establish techniques that safeguard against fraud, waste, and abuse while adhering to the approved uses of the drug. And these techniques include prior authorizations, step therapy, and clinical criteria. Due to the various inefficiencies in healthcare systems and networks, these processes can often amount to delayed access and other barriers to, uh, to care. Um, however, these interventions or tools uh, might not be able to be avoided uh, given the potential cost and public health impact of, you know, resistance, uh, losing eff potential losing efficacy of the drug, or even adverse effects on a specific patient. In terms of Medicaid, as of 2008, at least 31% of Ryan White clients were beneficiaries of Medicaid and about another 8% were duly eligible for Medicaid and Medicare. And so given this you know, nexus between Medicaid and the Ryan White program, it's really important for us to get a better understanding of Medicaid drug coverage laws and regulations. There are Medicaid implications of the price of an approved long acting antiretroviral drug, particularly if it is more expensive than oral regimens. Um, in terms of Medicaid law, there is a statute um, in the Social Security Act which really governs Medicaid law in section 1927, little d for big C of the act. And it provides that with respect to the treatment of a specific disease or condition for uh, a population that a drug may be excluded if that drug per its labeling and the scientific evidence um, uh, does not have a significant clinical uh, advantage in terms of safety, efficacy, and clinical outcomes over other drugs that are already included in the formulary for that particular condition. And so remember the product, the long acting product that we're talking about now um, is indicated for patients who have already achieved and maintained viral suppression on an oral uh, regimen and have also demonstrated tolerability uh, to oral versions of cabotegravir and ropivirine. And so we wonder if states may push back on having to pay more uh, essentially for issues that, that have already been addressed and resolved. In terms of Medicare, um, Medicare is a significant third party payer for many Ryan White and ADAP clients. Uh, as a reminder, the Ryan White uh, HIV AIDS program and, a and ADAP is the payer of last resort. And so Medicare would be the primary payer in this situation um, where a patient has both. As a provider administered drug, um, a long-acting injectable antiretroviral is expected to be covered by Medicare Part B, as in boy, and Medicare Part D, as in dog. Now, cost sharing can be considerable at up to about 20% of the Medicare approved cost on drugs and biologics covered under Medicare Part B, as in boy. The Medicare approved cost is based on the product's average sale price, which is an amount that tends to be similar to the wholesale acquisition cost or the public list price plus about 6%. In some cases, beneficiaries may be assessed an additional 20% cost sharing for the professional administration of the drug and the office visit charge. However, Coverage under Medicare Part D is more likely to occur if a Medicare Advantage plan with Part D coverage opts to cover it as a pharmacy benefit, not a medical benefit. In this scenario, a fixed dollar-based copayment once the deductible is met for the year as expected, or a percentage-based copayment on the price of the actual product 
plus separate cost sharing for the products administration and the office visit. In terms of commercial insurance, as a physician administered drug, we expect this combination product uh, to be covered by most commercial plans, either as a medical benefit or a pharmacy benefit. A challenge with drug coverage under the medical benefit is that uh, these drugs may not appear on a commercial plan's formulary. And this can make it difficult to determine whether the drug is in fact covered or not. However, we expect most plans to uh, cover the drug. Cost sharing amounts uh, will depend on costs associated with providers' drug procurement mechanisms and third-party coverage as either a medical benefit or pharmacy benefit. For example, uh, in cases where provider buy and bill models are used, the drug is covered as a medical benefit, cost sharing per office visit may depend on whether the product is administered as part of a routine clinic visit or as a standalone service. As for many plans, co-insurance based cost sharing is expected to be applied. On the other hand, uh, in cases where the drug is covered as a pharmacy benefit, uh, two cost sharing payments are expected to be required. One would be a co-payment or co-insurance amount charged by the specialty pharmacy for the drug. And the other would be a co-payment or co-insurance amount uh, charged by the provider for administration and the office visit. And so now we want to talk about uh, the buy and bill model uh, for ADAPS. So where ADAP is the primary payer for medications for clients in the Ryan White program, it generally pertains to uninsured full pay program clients. It is important to note that where ADAP is the primary payer, the ADAP will need to establish coverage parameters based on the ADAP's drug procurement mechanism, which is either a direct purchase model or a rebate model, the planning and coordination with jurisdictional Ryan White providers preference for either the buy and bill or white bagging models, the net cost comparison between these two models, and the ADAP staffing and resource capacity, as well as the pharmacy benefit manager's capacity. Where a buy and bill model is used by a Ryan White provider, ADAP programs with a rebate mechanism may accept and pay a bundled claim for both the product administration um, and then the product and the administration, and uh, then submit a rebate claim to the manufacturer. But where a buy and bill uh, model is used for full pay clients, ADAPs may need to establish a network of providers uh, agreeing to establish reimbursement rates and methodologies. For example, um, the rate might be set at the Medicare Part B uh, payment rate of the average sales price plus 6%. In terms of the white bagging model, uh, where this is preferred by ADAPS with the rebate procurement mechanism, and by the way, this is an approach that we believe the majority of ADAPS use, either the provider of ADAP, uh, the provider or ADAP orders an initial fill or refill from either a wholesaler, a specialty distributor or a specialty pharmacy. Um, the product order policies will need to be established by the ADAP. The specialty distributor pharmacy then invoices the ADAP for the full price of the drug plus any shipment or dispensing fees. The invoice is paid in full by the ADAP, then the product is shipped to the provider for administration. The Part B program or ADAP may pay for the administration fee depending on payment agreements with the provider and then the ADAP submits a full rebate claim to the manufacturer. Now I will uh, talk a little bit more about the white bagging uh, situation for ADAPs. In cases where ADAPs utilize direct purchase procurement, white bagging in collaboration with a wholesaler or contracted specialty distributor or pharmacy will be required. One mechanism may require the healthcare provider or other initial healthcare to provider uh, to order initial fills and refills from the ADAP. With this approach, 
The ADAP orders the drug through the 340B program at subceiling prices negotiated by the ADAP Crisis Task Force. And then the product is shipped to the provider. The Part B program or the ADAP may pay for the administration fee depending on the agreement with the provider. Another mechanism may allow for providers to order directly from a wholesaler or specialty distributor. And with this approach, uh, the product is shipped by the specialty distributor to the healthcare provider, and the specialty distributor stock is replenished through a ship to, bill to methodology using a 340B contract pharmacy arrangement. Again, the Part B program or the ADAP may pay for the administration fee depending on the agreements with the provider. These are just examples um, to consider. ADAP full pay program supply and payment structures are expected to vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And at this point, I will turn it over to Glenn Clark um, to really delve in a lot more into the potential impact of long acting antiretrovirals on Ryan White HIV programs and ADAPs. Thanks, Emeka. And again, it's a pleasure to be uh, sharing the uh, presentation with uh, the, these two experts. And, and clearly, we've heard from them about the complexity um, of, of these long acting antiretrovirals uh, and the implications of their, um, uh, the, their introduction into our HIV care delivery system. And what I'd like to talk about in this next section is the potential impact of these um, long acting ARVs on the RhymeWet program and more specifically on ADAP. And so, but I will say, um, uh, I wanna address up front a misconception I had when I initially heard about the long acting antiretrovirals. And while I admit some disappointment I felt when I learned more about kind of the potential impact of these early long-acting antiretrovirals. You know, I'm a social worker and I started in HIV 30 years ago in the dark days before antiretrovirals, working as a case manager in one of the hardest hit cities in the US, Washington DC, and with some of the hard, most vulnerable populations. And so when I heard about the long-acting antiretrovirals, I immediately thought of the homeless clients I worked with and those with active substance use or untreated mental illnesses the ones that were the hardest to engage and maintain in treatment, and what a helpful tool it would be to have them receive their ARVs by shot once a month or every few months. But while this isn't a, a wonderful advance in treatment, and you know Tim provided an overview of the potential advantages of these long-acting antiretrovirals, um, you know, Emeka also discussed the risks of the medications and, and the current guidelines for this initial long acting antiretroviral would not support its use with a number of the populations for whom we face challenges in helping them reach viral suppression. So I just wanted to address that up front. Um, next slide. So I'm first going to talk about the potential impact of these new these new medications on Rhyme White providers and ADAPs for clients they are serving that are uninsured. Now, clearly for these uninsured clients, the Rhyme White provider is often the sole payer for the costs of related to the client's outpatient HIV care. And because these clients are prescribed long-acting antiretrovirals will require monthly visits, uh, clinic visits, as we've heard, for the administration of the shot, as opposed to the current typical schedule of a visit every three to six months, the cost for the provider will increase. Um, the provider will need to ensure there is clinic capacity and staffing to support monthly injections. And the long-acting antiretrovirals, as, as we've heard, will most likely be more expensive than the current antiretroviral options, increasing the drug cost for whoever is paying, whether that's the Ryan White provider or more likely the ADAP. The providers will need to store and manage the medications as, as Tim had talked about the cold, the cold um, chain transport um, and storage, and um, uh, which they do not currently do for you know, the, the current antiretrovirals their clients are taking. But lastly, and, and I would, as again, as a social worker, you know, uh, as importantly, the provider needs to be able to support the client in this increased intensity of appointments, and that's that includes through client reminders, transportation assistance, and follow-up for missed appointments. Next slide. 
So even in situations where a client has health insurance to cover the cost of the medication and medical visits, the long-acting antiretrovirals will potentially present systems and coordination challenges for providers. Providers will need to ensure appropriate capacity and staffing to support the monthly injections, for example, scheduling capacity, exam room availability, availability of licensed staff to administer the drug. Um, as we've heard, you know, this, is, this requires a Z-tracking injection technique. Um, and as we've just mentioned, you know, making sure that there's appropriate drug storage and inventory management. And similar again to uninsured clients, the providers will need to ensure capacity and staffing to support monthly client retention, including transportation assistance, client reminders, and diligent missed appointment follow-up. Next slide. So I wanna talk for just a few minutes about the potential impact of long-acting antiretrovirals on ADAP specifically. Now, as you know, the ADAPs are the federal government safety net medication providers for the uninsured and underinsured people with HIV. And they most often operate, you know, are operated by the state health department. So as the primary payer for medications within the Ryan White program, ADAPs are especially impacted by increased drug costs. As a safety net program, ADAPs you know, often cover FDA-approved medications that aren't covered by Medicaid or Medicare Part D or other third-party payer, third payers like, like health insurance. And they will also, again, um, cover the uh, cost-sharing costs of a client. And as we've heard, um, those, those cost sharings for these long-acting antiretrovirals are anticipated to be higher. As noted earlier, these medications will likely be distributed through specialty pharmacies, um, which is not the traditional route for ADAPs to purchase medications, and um, which frankly, ADAPs have traditionally had challenges in engaging with. And finally, which we'll talk more about on the next slide, ADAPs can choose to cover the cost of administering the ADAP, the long-acting antiretroviral medications, um, but will face the challenge of setting up systems to pay for the service. Next slide. So in preparation for the approval of the long-acting antiretrovirals, HAB released a letter from Dr. Laura Cheever um, back in December uh, of 2014, 2019, I'm sorry. Um, I wanna focus on a few highlights from the letter. The first is that for the first time, HAB states that it is allowable for an ADAP to pay for the cost of administering an antiretroviral medication on the ADAP formulary including the cost of an office visit exclusively for medication administration. And again, this is new that ADAP funds could be used for the administration of a, the cost of administering a medication. The letter also states for clients who have health insurance coverage, the ADAP can cover the client's cost sharing related to an office visit exclusively for medication administration. Now, the letter also recommends that ADAPs consider adding the long-acting antiretrovirals to their formularies once they are available. Now, as you may know, the ADAPs are required to have at least one drug from each class of antiretrovirals on their formulary, but are not required to add a new drug in an existing class of antiretrovirals if they are already meeting the standard. Next slide. So, what do Ryan White recipients and providers need to do to prepare for the approval of long-acting antiretrovirals? I wanna first focus on projecting impact. So we encourage you to work on a methodology for projecting the potential increase in client costs or in costs for your insured clients and uninsured clients that are prescribed long-acting antiretrovirals. As we've noted, you'll wanna consider the cost of increased number of clinic visits, increased cost of medications, drug product, product storage and inventory management, and client retention and adherence efforts. I would encourage you to talk to other Ryan White funded recipients in your area, including the ADAP, to see what they are planning to cover and to see if there are opportunities for collaboration and coordination. Next slide. You will also need to explore any changes that your system may require to acquire and pay for the long-acting antiretrovirals and their administration. For example, are there new contracts needed? 
are new partnerships or relationships required? How will the ADAP and the Ryan White providers coordinate to facilitate the successful purchase and administration of the long-acting antiretrovirals? And for ADAPs, if they choose to pay for the cost of administering the medications, how will they accomplish this? What systems do they need to set up to make this happen? Next slide. As I've noted earlier, whether clients are insured or not, there will be increased burden on the, on the care delivery system to handle the administration of the medications. Some questions to explore are, what changes will your system need to handle the additional clinic appointments for medication administration and for increased monitoring to ensure client engagement and a successful treatment experience? And for each of the changes we've noted, what process and timeline are needed to accomplish the changes within your system? And will you be ready um, once these long-acting antiviral, antiretrovirals are approved? So we're gonna pause next to take questions on the material we've presented today. I know there was a lot. But after that, we'd like to have a discussion with you about the long-acting antiretrovirals and the impact you think they may have on your system and clients.